Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Stabilization of Native and Functional Membrane Proteins for Drug Discovery, presented by Anas Johari, Chief Scientific Officer of Calixar. We are excited to bring you this educational webcast presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Gibco, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Anash Johari. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Okay. Thank you very much, Christine, and thank you all for organizing this webinar. I don't know if you can hear me correctly. Good. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you to all the people that are attending this webinar. So um, what I would like to do today is to try to tell you what we do at Calixar and then to try to explain basically uh, how we stabilize uh, native and functional membrane proteins for drug discovery. Uh, so uh, the, this presentation is is uh, already organized that I will be uh, describing some case studies and then hopefully I will be happy also to uh, address some of your questions if you have some at the end of the presentation. Since it was said said in, a, in a previously, it's uh, an interactive discussions and I'm happy to uh, address uh, specific questions if you have. So before I go to the scientific part, this is a few words about Calixar. So it's a biotechnology company based in France. So we have two sites, one site in, based in Lyon, uh, in France, and where we do all the biochemistry part, and I will describe exactly what we do precisely. And then the other side, which is based in Avignon, it's a, a cross uh, collaboration we have with the University of Avignon, where we actually uh, the, do chemistry of membrane proteins. So we basically synthesize compounds that uh, have an important um, um, stabilization and or solubilization um, effect on membrane proteins. And those compounds are amphiphytic molecules. I don't have time to go into the detail, but really these are a key chemistry that we develop to be able to actually stabilize uh, membrane proteins and use them for drug discovery uh, applications, okay? So uh, this is just a general slide to tell you that yes, indeed, we are based in France, but we also have um, offices in the US and in Japan. Now, the reason we are really focusing on membrane proteins, and this is quite obvious, but it's always good to, to uh, remind uh, people in the audience is that membrane proteins are really key uh, proteins for drug discovery, for medical uh, relevance. But me, uh, by saying this, it's important to realize also that these proteins are extremely challenging. And that's the reason why we don't have much of crystal structure salt, we don't have much of drugs developed against uh, these proteins or antibodies, for example, developed against these proteins because it's just simply difficult to produce them and have them uh, stable uh, in solution. So that's the reason why we decided to really to come up with ideas and then generate um, tools to be able to solubilize them, stabilize them, and I will tell you a little bit more about this in the next couple of slides, okay? So at Calixar, what we do is um, trying to start from different biological membranes or different biological material, and the goal is to maintain functionality when you solubilize and stabilize the protein. The goal is to keep the protein native, and, and um, this is important because there are all kinds of approaches that con consist on mutating the proteins, proteins, also add infusion proteins in order to stabilize them. Okay, that's worked very well, this is quite nice, but you might, to a certain extent, for some specific cases, be a little bit far from the native situation, and therefore 
ending up generating um, drugs or uh, antibodies or uh, or small molecule compounds. Again, something that actually it's slightly or very different from the native situation. So that's the reason we decided to avoid modifying the protein, but instead of modifying the protein, we rather decided to modify the chemistry around the protein. So that's why we are innovating in terms of chemistry of solubilization and or stabilization. Now, um, just a small um, summary of actually our activities. We um, have different activities related to discovery. Uh, this is what we call the organization, for example, or identification or localization, sometimes also crystallization. So this is all um, uh, related to membrane proteins, and um, we, can, we can discuss this in more detail in, if you get in touch later on. But typically, the, the main focus is also to produce proteins uh, for drug discovery. So how to do that? We, are, we have to be able to express the protein uh, as well as possible, as good as possible. And so we, uh, the reason I'm presenting also today is because we start to look into that uh, more carefully and also collaborate with the best people. And I think the official, the official scientist, the scientific is also one of the best in terms of innovation of the expression. And that's also um, uh, the reason we really look into this aspect to be able to generate ex um, cells that express the protein and they'll be able to have a starting material that is a decent. Uh, starting material to be able to extract it, purify it, stabilize it, and then go to different applications, including crystallization, but not only crystallization. So during this process, what is really important is to, to verify that uh, the protein is not unfolded, that the protein is still functional. I think that's really the key. And then because if you use SDS or you use um, some classical detergent sometime, you can solubilize your protein, but you don't know actually what you are solubilizing. You are solubilizing most of the time aggregate, and you don't want to generate uh, hits or to generate um, drugs against aggregate. So it's important really to to qualify the material you will be using for drug discovery. So that's the reason we really are uh, trying to quality quality control these uh, samples. And I will come back to this. Now, how do we do that practically? So we have developed a non-denaturated process, which is basically a detergent surfactant-based approach. So this was um, patented, so there's around six patents actually now. The idea is to avoid refolding, avoid mutagenesis, avoid truncation, avoid fusion, and still have an improvement in stability of membrane proteins and still maintain functionality and structural integrity. So I think that's really the key, these two aspects structural integrity and then the functionality. These are the two important parameters that you have to include into your equation, into your solubilization purification equation, if you want to end up with decent sample to be used for drug discovery. Now, how do we do that? I told you already that we, instead of mutating the protein, we actually decided to change the chemistry around the protein by um, using innovative detergent and surfactant approach. So the, there are different compounds that we developed. There are basically four categories. Today I will be focusing mainly on one of the categories here, um, indicated in bold. So the, the compounds that help to solubilize and stabilize at the same time. I think that's really the key because this is where things can go wrong when you don't um, stabilize at this step because you can solubilize uh, and then if you solubilize the protein and if the protein is unfolded, it's really difficult then to stabilize it further because you already unfolded from the beginning. So that's why from the beginning, you have to combine the two aspects, solubilize and stabilize. Then there are also other compounds that help to stabilize protein that is already quite well folded. can hear me? Okay. Um, yes, I was saying that basically we can be using detergent micelles, protoliposomes, uh, membrane scaffold protein, or lipoparticles. So basically the idea is really to solubilize in the, in the best, um, let's say, scenario 
and then you can formulate in different um, um, platforms uh, if you wish to be used for your application. So these are two publications that uh, describe basically some, uh, the first one is review, we have, uh, we describe all the, all the different format that exist. And the second one is actually um, a scientific article describing how the, the possibility to actually quantify the detergent around the protein to be actually used uh, for modeling or to be used to learn more about cryo-EM maps, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a case study I will be describing. It's a um, classical um, uh, GPCR. It's actually really, really well characterized in the GPCR community, except that uh, the one that everybody is actually working with is a truncated and mutated version of this protein. So our challenge was to, to decide to actually work with the native form of the protein. So that means without truncation, so it's around 96 amino acid and acid aminos that people are truncating. And there are eight mutations in this protein in the literature, and we basically work with the native wild type version of the protein. So the first question was, are we able to express it? In this case, we could express in yeast, but it could also express in insect cells. So I don't uh, go into the detail, but this is really classical expression, I would say. I'm sure that using a sophisticated um, expression system from Thermo Fisher will uh, give us more chances to have more protein and maybe more healthy protein, but we did not um, try this yet, but maybe this is something that we'll be doing in collaboration in the next couple of weeks, uh, months. So now when you express the protein, what you want to do is to look for the right detergent condition to extract it. So we noticed that most of the time people are, have tendency to come back again to the same detergent condition that they used to have. And I think that's really um, awkward somehow, especially when you think about the diversity of membrane proteins, and also the diversity of the detergent that goes with is not really there. So it's, um, it's not really correlated. So that's the reason we think it's important to screen large using um, the new tools that we have been developing recently that allow to screen 96 uh, conditions, including some of uh, proprietary compounds of Calisar, but also uh, commercially available detergents, and then also combination of detergents, because this is also an important parameter. Very often we stick to one compound or one detergent, and combining them can also uh, be extremely valuable and needs, need to be tested. And I think in our hand, at least, we could see that there is an added value in combining tools. Now, we could find the conditions that allow to solubilize a protein here. I will not go into the detail, but basically we could we could solubilize total protein that you see in the western blot here in the right uh, side of this presentation. And then we could then use um, uh, Talern Affinity, I believe in this case, this tag to purify the protein. Now the question is, okay, you could purify, you could express your protein, you could purify it. How does it look like in terms of uh, what I mentioned before, in terms of quality controls? in terms of behavior and solution, and also in terms of functionality. So in terms of functionality, the only functional assay that we have done here is actually to re radio ligand binding using well-characterized ligand, which is this ZDM2413-85, um, uh, okay, and um, which is actually an antagonist. We have looked into uh, KDs and to um, uh, all kind of um, uh, study uh, to verify that this protein is able to bind to ligand. He's, here is only one point that we will, that we show, showing the specificity of the binding of the ligand when you compare the blue, which is the total, to the, to the green, which is basically a specific uh, binding. You really come up to the conclusion that the protein is healthy enough to be able actually to bind to the ligand. Now, if you look into native page, you see that the protein goes into the gel and that means that you don't have aggregates and the proteins seem to be quite homogeneous. Interestingly, in size exclusion chromatography, you also see similar conclusion, which is that the protein does not come out um, into the void volume. It seems to behave as, uh, as a homogeneous sample. So, okay, so this looks nice. And next question is, is it, still, is it stable? So how do you look into stability? We have looked in here at that by uh, size exclusion chromatography. And we could see that over time, 
after even seven days, uh, this native GPCR is actually still uh, stable, even at 37 degrees. This is uh, quite stable after seven days. We see, you can see some shoulder here uh, in the beginning at three days, but does not seem to be uh, worse after uh, four more days. So obviously, we have quite stable version of adenosine receptor, which sounds quite easy, but actually it's quite astonishing because adenosine receptor, like all uh, native GPCRs, is not very stable. And people have been truncating it and mutating it uh, like hell to be able to stabilize. And here it does not seem to be uh, a major problem when you find the right chemistry that stabilizes the protein. Now, when you look into um, another readout in terms of stability, which is described here, here is a method that was uh, published uh, two years ago that consists on heating the sample, centrifuging it, and then uh, performing Western blot, and then looking to the intensity of the band at T0, and then over time. And then you see here uh, that uh, in the red version or the red uh, experiment, with DDM, we could come up with a TM, which is around 45 degrees, which is very well consistent with the literature, okay? And then the green uh, is actually the conditions that we could come up with, which is a combination between DDM and our parietal compounds. You could see that you have significant improvement in terms of thermal stability without having to mutate any single amino acid. And I think this is really, uh, for me, an illustration, and we have, of course, seen that for all kind of um, uh, sorry uh, target that uh, we worked with. Of course, this presentation is focused only on the data that we can communicate on that are um, outcome of our own research and development. And of course, all the data we are generating with pharma companies that we work with. This is um, of course not disclosed here, but you will see it's, it's quite similar conclusions, similar tools we will be using whatever the application and whatever will be the target we will be working on. So we also looked into this sample by electron microscopy. This was a collaboration that we have and we still have with the Strasbourg University. We could see different particles, uh, crowded particles, of course, but this is also an indication that the protein is not aggregated uh, as was uh, already um, illustrated by the size exclusion chromatography and native page. Now, recently, we initiated also a collaboration with another group uh, in this time. It's an NMR group, where we are now able to look into different fragments and see how those fragments can bind or not to our um, GPCR, native GPCR. And the idea is first, I don't show it here, but we could already show that, um, you know, adenosine is able to bind to adenosine receptor. Caffeine is also being able to bind. And then interestingly, we could now learn about mechanistically um, if two ligands can bind both to the same uh, receptor or is uh, are they able to compete one with the other. And this will be really more and more developed to understand mechanistically uh, autoristeric and allosteric binding of uh, different fragments that we want now to discover. So this was done by STD and then also here by water loxy. So it's without going into the detail, but typically the idea is if you have high quality protein in solution, you might want to use it to do FPDD using NMR, for example, or using SPR. So of course, if the two methods can be uh, applied, so you can immobilize using your tagged, your tag into your protein and then use this to screen for different uh, ligands. Okay, now uh, this is another um, protein which is a transporter, so this is a published work. Um, uh, you can have a look to that. I think uh, we'll summarize it only in one slide. So the idea is to, to produce this protein in, in the optimal condition that was um, described in literature uh, in terms of solubilization and stabilization. And then one uh, other experiment will be to produce this protein using one of the, in this case, was a calixarane-based protein. And interestingly, what you see here in these histograms is that um, this transporter is absolutely not active in the state of the art condition. So basically using, I don't remember if it was FC12 or it's, if I'm not mistaken, it was DDM and FC12. So in comparison to the membrane, we could 
maintain 90% of the ATPase activity of this transporter uh, using our compounds in this case. So clearly we could, it was probably one of the initial example on terms of um, how we could maintain functional status of the protein. So, so we can have a look to this um, article to learn more about the detail, but typically, even if you have a pure and nice protein, it does not tell you that it's, it's gonna be active and obviously plain like chemistry can actually make it active or not active depending if it's uh, favorable or not favorable chemistry. So this is now another, so that really the, the idea behind this presentation is to illustrate basically the approach we are using, starting from different cell types, and then, um, and then uh, be able to, uh, to illustrate that this approach can apply to different family of membrane proteins, but also to different cell types for also different applications. So here it's um, the case of a protein that was expressed in hex cells, um, sorry, I forget to mention this was from E. coli. What I showed you before was SF9, and uh, now um, this was from hex cells. And the idea was, are we able or not to extract, let's say, the native um, complex of these two proteins, our FAS and then EGF receptor, and are we maintaining to a certain extent oligomeric state? And indeed, when you do a native page, you see that you have high molecular weight protein that correspond to tetrameric form or to dimeric form for FAS and then EGF receptor respectively. So that means that the way you take the protein out of the membrane, you somehow maintain the, the, the right oligomeric state. I'm not talking about conformation because that's another story, but at least in terms of assembly, you actually would be able to maintain. And I will show you at the end in this presentation how we could actually maintain protein-protein interactions and actually identify a known partner of one uh, interesting protein. Now this, I will not go into detail because this is not published work yet. So this was a collaboration we had with Scripps and IIV on HIV envelope protein, which is made of, a, of a GP120 and GP41. It's actually a trimer of protein that was not stable at all. And the best conditions that our partners could find is basically what is shown here after three hours, the trimer is falling apart. So uh, using some of our compounds, we, actually, we could actually stabilize this um, envelope protein and, and we could uh, show that it's um, a functional complex that we are able to extract and not some kind of artifactual stabilization effect. So please have a look in the next couple of months on the literature if you want to learn more about this. This is not published, but it will hopefully will be published soon. So I don't have time to go into the detail of this. Um, so I will move on now to another family of protein, which is um, ion channel. So in this case, it's a co-transporter. It's a potassium chloride co-transporter that we uh, worked with. This is an important channel because it's involved in um, intraneural chloride homostasis, and it's involved also in water flux. So of course, different CNN involved in this um, uh, it can be used, it can result in, in pathologies. Um, from the biochemical point of view, nothing really is known except that it might probably be made of 12 transmembrane domain and it might exist as an oligomer. Okay, so we have expressed this protein in hex cells um, and then we could solubilize it. You see here is the lime 3 in the left uh, gel. You, this is the soluble fraction comparison to the total. We could purify it also by affinity and now by using cross linking using glutaraldehyde, we could show that uh, the protein can exist as a dimer and can probably ex also exist as a monomer. So this was really uh, a nice illustration that uh, the protein does not exist as tetramer, octamer, or whatever complex oligomer. It seems to exist as a two populations, monomers and dimers. And interestingly, the dimers, at the interface of the dimers, we could see that uh, in presence of DTT, we actually lose the dimer, so which suggests that the interface of the dimerization, we have uh, these refill bridges. So again, this is another story that's about to be published. I don't have time to go into the detail, but typically what we could do, and this is in collaboration with a, with a pharma company, 
uh, we could actually resolve the structure by electron microscopy of this protein and then uh, do mass spectrometry to learn more about what are residues involved in the, on the activity, what are the phosphorylations, glycosylations that are involved. And uh, this is a, a story that um, will be submitted actually uh, next week. So here, I think what the, key, the, the take home message from this slide is just, yes, we indeed we can use, if we have the right cell expression system, and this needs to be discussed, um, we can uh, solubilize the right uh, oligomeric state and they're characterized by different um, goals. So by, you could also do biocore analysis actually to immobilize this channel and then you look for binding of specific antagonists. So the applications are, are quite uh, various, variable. It can be um, structural biology or um, ligand screening or uh, mass spectrometry and, and other characterization methods. So, but the key is, do you express or not the protein correctly and I think that's that's an important uh, point to keep in mind and also especially for this uh, discussions of today. Now another uh, channel also and I try to uh, accelerate a bit the presentation that we have time for discussions and exchange. Um, what's really um, important is to show that this is another channel which is in this case a proton selective ion channel from the influenza as we have been using as a case study to show that we are able to produce the full length version, the native version that was not produced actually until now because people have been sensitizing only peptide that is um, uh, responsible for the conductivity for the pore. As you can see here, there was uh, several papers describing the structure of this, uh, high impact papers describing the structure of this, but nobody really could express and solubilize and purify the full length version of this channel. And that was basically our challenge. So we use the virus itself uh, to infect cells that are MDCK cells. Then we uh, looked into the prepared membranes and then start looking to see if we have the right um, um, uh, antigens that were expressed. And then interestingly, yes, we could see no amine days, we could see hemagglutinin, we could see M M2. Then we started uh, solubilizing the protein, as you can see here. That's a soluble fraction, and that's the pellet. So in the pellet, there is nothing, and in, in the solubilized fraction, we have pretty much everything. Too. So we could solubilize totally the protein. Now the question is, are you able to purify it? And indeed, we could purify it. We could also see in gel filtration that it was not aggregated, but then we did not really know what's the oligomeric state. So when you do native page, you could start saying, well, I have an oligomer, but I'm not in the, in the position to tell if this is only going to be a monomer, dimer, or tetramer. We know from the from the literature that the, the functional state of this channel is actually a tetramer, but we have to show that it exists as a tetramer. And that's exactly what we have done here using uh, cross-linking, using glutehalde, you, you could go from monomer to tetramer. So obviously, what we express, solubilize, and purify was a tetrameric version of the protein. So we know that um, um, we know that this is um, the tetramic version is um, somehow the functional state of the protein, okay? But uh, so that suggests that we could isolate the functional protein, but this is only a suggestion, so some kind of indirect evidence. So that's why we had to come up with an assay to actually measure the activity. That's what we have done here. We used the purified protein insert it into lipid bilayer, start measuring current at different pH because it's a proton selective ion channel. And we could see a specific current voltage measurements here, curves, and this is a typically uh, an indication that the protein was functional. We want further by adding a specific inhibitor, which is amantadine, and then we could go from totally active to totally inactive. So that means that the way we uh, solubilize and purify the protein could allow to maintain the functionality and the oligomeric state of the protein, which is exactly what we expect for all. I want to add also to this, um, to, to, uh, to stress the fact that here, I'm talking about uh, published data or, or R&D work, but is this exactly the same work we are doing with highly druggable targets like NAVs or P2X, um, compound, uh, sorry, proteins that are involved in 
really different pathology that are uh, extremely pluggable targets. Okay. So uh, last couple of um, slides uh, to tell you that we could also stabilize without having to solubilize. So this is an example of a model protein that everybody is familiar with, which is the bacterial rhodopsin. The bacterial rhodopsin was solubilized, purified, uh, by I don't remember what company, and then we basically just bought, bought the, this uh, lyophilized um, uh, protein, and then ask the question: What's happen if you resuspend this in presence of different compounds, and how these compounds can um, impact positively or negatively on the stability or the functional stability of this target? And that's what we see using OJ proteins. Absolutely not stable when you look into the fluorescent or solid to the absorbance of 960 as an indication of the activity of the protein. And um, now using uh, uh, FA3 or Amphipol or LMNG, it does not seem to Is it back? Seem to be back, but I'm not sure. Good. Okay, so I keep keep going. So obviously, what this what I like this in this slide is the fact that it shows you that uh, you, you don't need to mutate the protein. You only have to play around with the right chemistry uh, that stabilizes the protein. So here it's exactly the same protein, and you have cases which are absolutely not um, favorable for the stability or the functional stability of the protein and others using this calyx glycoside. You really have a stabilization effect on this uh, protein. And it's gonna be the same story with other targets. Now, uh, similarly, we know that cholesterol hemisuccinate have been developed uh, by uh, several people uh, and, and uh, used heavily in the GPCR community to stabilize membrane proteins. We thought, okay, why don't we use the some kind of steroidic um, compounds that we link to one of the calyxerin platform and see if it might have some uh, stabilization effect. And that's exactly what we have done. And this is actually a patent that is, um, is available now, um, where we could show that this compound have a significant improvement in terms of ligand binding study on uh, GPCRs. So here it's, uh, don't remember what GPCR we have used, but we have tried in different GPCRs and we see that not only you stabilize the protein, but in the top of that, we are actually stabilizing ligand binding properties of the receptor. And just to finish the presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, this is an example where we basically used the same approach, but not to address the same question. So here the question is, uh, was a growing collaboration with um, a group in Italy. So the, the, the idea was, that uh, these uh, collaborators have a focus on a protein called BAC3, which is um, a pancreatic um, cancer marker, basically. It activates macrophage to a specific unknown receptor. The question is, they always see this protein around macrophage by fluorescence, but they have no idea why this presentation, this, sorry, this uh, protein is actually uh, linked to this membrane. So the, the, the idea or the hypothesis was that if we see it, it's most probably because it's binding to a receptor to a specific partner. Okay. So if you use a native solubilization method, um, as I described before, you might be able to actually maintain protein-protein interactions. And therefore, if you use a pull-down assay, you can enrich uh, your native factory receptor complexes. And then maybe using mass spectrometry, you can actually identify the partner. And that's exactly what we have done, and this is how we could identify interferon and just transmembrane protein 2 as a specific receptor of bacteria in macrophage. And this was cross-validated by different 
methods I don't have time to discuss today, but typically this was published in Nature.com three years ago. So the, you see it's the same approach can actually apply to address different kind of questions. So uh, produce protein to be used for uh, drug discovery, including structure-based drug discovery, fragment-based drug design, but also antibody discovery and vaccine. And in the other time, you can actually use the same approach to identify new partners and also to de-orphanize. I did not talk about this, but if you have a specific ligand that's binding to a specific receptor, you can actually learn which one is binding to which one. So, and this work has been done now for uh, four or five years, and we have been working on more than 140 different targets, and of course, most of them, uh, in terms of proportion, I would say the IGPCRs, ion channels, are the, the most important ones. And of course, there are other ones, transporters, receptors, uh, and also viral targets. And um, these are the different scientific partners that we have, so different ones I'm um, talking about. So chemistry to stabilization is a new consortium we could come up with recently to generate uh, new detergent to factor to and also polymers to stabilize and solubilize and stabilize membrane proteins and then other academic groups all over the world i mentioned already script max Planck, etc etc and then recently a, a, a first interactions we initiated together with thermo fisher scientific and this is hopefully will be really uh, bridging the gap between expression world and then uh, drug discovery and we are happy to be part of this discussion and, and uh, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take questions if you have some. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Joe Harry, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how different is your approach to others? Sorry, I did not, I did not hear your questions. If you had the questions, it was, was cut somehow. No problem. I asked, how different is your approach to others? Yeah, I think that if I, I, I try to, I think, I guess this presentation is helpful to understand this. Typically, uh, I think the approach that we are using is an alternative approach, which is uh, to, to what people most of the time are using, which consists on stabilizing membrane proteins by mutagenesis, by truncation, and also by fusion proteins. So the, the idea here is really to mutate the chemistry around the protein and find the right, fine tune the conditions that help to stabilize and stabilize membrane proteins and keeping the right native sequence to be, uh, to hopefully don't interfere too much with uh, the structural and functional integrities of the protein. Of course, there's not always a guarantee that you're using a specific Detergent surfactant, you are not able to change a little bit the conformation or or totally the conformation. This is something that you have to address. But I think it's not one approach against the other. I think it's just a complementary approach that um, help to um, to de-risk the projects from the beginning. And I think that's really a key uh, point to keep in mind when we start a drug discovery program. Thank you. For our next question we have, is mammalian cell suitable for the membrane protein expression? And do you ever successfully purify a membrane protein from, a mammali from mammalian cells? Yeah, I think ma mammalian, sorry. Uh, mammalian cells are great for two reasons. One of the reason I think is that um, you are able to scale up the production easily. 
And the second, I think it's related to the quality of the, of the protein or to relative to the post-transfer modifications, especially when you work with the human proteins, it's always good to keep in mind that uh, you want to have some post-transfer modifications. Of course, they will probably not be exactly the same ones that you are that you are um, that you want for your protein. Actually, very often you don't know exactly what PTMs you want, but it's important to keep in mind that um, to 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 uh, know that possibly to your uh, to, to the organism that you want for which you want to express the protein of interest. So that's why mammalian cells are suitable, and I think that will be more and more useful for um, for membrane protein production toward drug discovery. And yes, indeed, we have been using that uh, very often, and we will be using this more and more now uh, for large scale up production of membrane proteins for drug discovery. Thank you. Okay, next question. How do I know which compound to buy in order to stabilize and solubilize my membrane protein? Do you sell kits? And if so, do I need specific detection methods or simply native gel and SEC to determine which is the best compound? Hey, that's a good question. Uh, it's a very good question. It's um, it always. I think there's not always, um, you know, uh, the same answer to all questions. So it's it's it de always depend what question you want to address, what application, what target, what um, quality control we want to implement that uh, are uh, correlated to this application and to these goals. And then, so this is a case, always a case by case scenario. There is no um, recipe for success. The only recipe is to to adapt basically the, the, the protocols and, the, and the, um, the quality controls that you want to implement. Uh, we uh, at Calixar use uh, proprietary compounds, but we also use uh, the classical detergents that are available, uh, uh, commercially available. So, and also combine them, I think I mentioned this in the presentation, combine them to be able to address specific questions in terms of stability, in terms of solubilization. Uh, so our compounds are not uh, available, and you cannot find them uh, basically uh, commercially. They are not commercially available. If you want to test basically um, uh, the, the, the approach that we are using, you would have to uh, contact us, and then we can put together a um, uh, program uh, to, to study your protein of interest in, in particular. We don't sell them because what we sell is basically the expertise on our on membrane protein uh, by chemistry and not on, on chemistry. So there are people that are selling detergents as a kit. This is not what we are doing. And we think that this is not um, helpful. What we are um, giving access to is actually the expertise on membrane proteins. But uh, we are happy to discuss this uh, later on. Please uh, contact me uh, and then we can talk about this aspect. I think the email address is actually indicated here if you want to contact me directly. Okay, thank you. For the next question, is your approach to apply to a specific membrane protein family or different ones? It's what I try to um, to illustrate in this presentation is the fact that um, we can apply this approach to a wide range of uh, families of membrane proteins, not only to class one GPCR, for example. So it's, it's, it's not uh, specifically applied for one subtype of, of, of proteins. It can apply uh, to first different families of membrane proteins. I mentioned GPCRs, I mentioned ion channels, I mentioned viral targets, I mentioned transporters. So they are extremely different from the biochemical point of view and still we are using the similar tools to actually address that. And you can also use this approach to apply to apply uh, solubilization and stabilization methodology, starting from different biological materials. So I mentioned uh, virus, I mentioned uh, hex cells, I mentioned CHO cells, I mentioned bacteria, I mentioned yeast. So yeah, so it's quite diverse. 
The only thing that they are in common is actually membranes. That's it. Okay, next question. How do you stabilize membrane proteins? The, 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 really the idea is to step a little bit back on the way we work on membrane proteins, not systematically uh, be scary because my protein is not stable in solution and right away start engineering it. I think it's important to fine tune the conditions in terms of use the right detergent surfactants. And this can be also uh, through the use of, of classical detergent, not only use our proprietary compounds. And what I noticed, I, what I noticed, sorry, by interaction with all kind of membrane protein experts all over the world is very often they come back to the same detergents because they were successful using one or, or two detergents. And if you think about the diversity of membrane proteins, if you think about the diversity of the detergents people are using, it does not really fit. So uh, you will have to be open mind and then uh, screen different detergent conditions and then uh, have a clear view what are the quality controls you want to implement. And then I think it's going to be successful. So the, the, the way we stabilize actually just by changing the chemistry around the protein, by adapting the chemistry around the protein to a specific target, but also to a specific application. Because think about it, when you want to crystallize a protein, you don't purify your protein the same way than if you want to use it to generate hits or to do biocore bio like in screening, or to do, um, I don't know, uh, antibody discovery. So these are completely different applications. So that's why the solubilization purification methodology have to actually adapt this and include this uh, last um, uh, format or the last uh, preparation into the equation to be able to be successful. Thank you. Okay, next question. How do you qualify your solubilized or pro purified proteins in terms of function and structure? The evaluating if this is an aggregate or not, for example, for that we do size exclusion chromatography. We also do native page cross-linking, sometimes also dynamic light scattering, uh, ITC. So basically the question is how that my protein behave in solution. And what we don't want is to have aggregate, that's obvious. And what you also want is to have a homogeneous protein. So therefore um, you have to evaluate if you have a, a dimeric form, a tetrameric form, if you have a mixture of populations or not. So that's for the behavior and solution. Uh, for sure, uh, using electron microscopy to see how does it look like your purified protein, protein can also help to gain insight into if my protein is homogeneous or not, is it aggregated or not. So that's for the structural aspect. In terms of functionality, this is always protein dependent or family dependent. So classically for GPCRs, what we'll be doing is ligand binding studies. We will be doing biocore, we'll be doing um, fluorescence binding if you have a fluor, uh, fluor 4. If you have antibody that recognizes the target, we can actually use this to do ELISA. Uh, for iron channels, what we will be doing is um, um, ligand binding study. So typically, you can mark a toxin and then see if the toxin is able to bind. You can also do uh, electrophysiology or, or let's say uh, similar to electrophysiology, what I was showing you. So basically, you can insert the protein in, in the lipid bilayer and start measuring current. So this is not always straightforward because uh, you have to find really the right conditions to insert your protein and then that you have a specific signal. And the only way to really ensure that this specific signal is related to your protein is adding specific inhibitors that will shut down the channel specifically. So that's one way. For transporters, you can actually measure, you can reconstitute your protein, put a liposome, for example, and start measuring currents so um, yeah, so that's okay, always a case by case scenario. From the structural point of view, you can use the same tools for all family of proteins, 
but then from the from the functional point of view you can adapt the quality controls depending on the the biochemistry or the functionality of the target specific functionality of the target Thank you. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Johari for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots and Gibco, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Additional questions will be answered and published on Thermo Fisher Scientific's website. You will receive an email notification when answers are available. And before we go, I'd like to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.